Silver Extant logo fades in on a purple background. Purple background white text. Pathways Directors Roundtable, 5th of December 2022. Navigating the industry. Panelists. Maria Ashodi, Rod Dungate, Olushala Oyaleye, Alex Bulmer. Access support. Jamie Mayer, host, Caroline J. Ratnam Joyner. It now gives me great pleasure to welcome Maria, our Artistic Director at Expands. Thank you very much, Caroline. Hello, everybody. and uh, Thanks very much for coming along. And um, I just shoved myself into this uh, panel right at the last minute and said to Caroline, oh, can I can I chip in and say something? And um, she very kindly let me in. So I'm not going to take up too much time because I know that really strictly we want to hear from our guest um guest directors, which we're really, we're really pleased and could attend today. But I just thought it might be interesting if, if, you, if you're not aware of kind of how I got to where I, I am um, at the moment, uh, working with the company. Um, <clears throat> after starting off uh, in my career as a writer for theatre, um, obviously I was, I was sort of, you know, uh, working as a freelance writer, um, <laughs> I was just thinking about Shola actually. Shola um, produced, uh, I think, my second play back in about 1980. No, I mustn't say. I mustn't, I mustn't say the date. Um, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> um, and yes, you know, that's that's what I was doing. I was kind of a, a jobbing freelance writer. I had an agent, and um, and it was a it was it was great uh, for a while, and then it felt like the pressure was really on for my profile to be raised and raised and raised and raised and raised by my agent. And I didn't feel that I could really keep up with the pace. Um, I wanted to sort of do other things. I wanted to study theatre. Um, and so I decided to um, break my relationship with the agent and um, I, I went to university quite quite late in the day actually um, as a mature student and I, I, I studied theatre and English and that was great actually I really enjoyed that break um, and it enabled me to have a real think about what it was that I wanted to do um, during those three years and I knew I was still interested in, in the arts um, I was particularly getting more and more interested in disability arts getting more sort of politicised I suppose and um, I, I came out of university and got a job with Shape which was a brilliant um, moulding uh, of practice and politics. There were um, some fantastic disabled artists working for the organisation at the time and I learned a hell of a lot um, not only for them, from them about basically how to make ends meet being an artist having a, a day job you know doing your art practice um, but just also about how how to run projects and and um, and to work within a disability led organisation. Um, and I was there for about four years, and then and then I I came out to um, to join a production. I was offered a part as an actor, believe it or not, in a in a production, um, which was a real experience. Let's put it that way, um, good and bad, and. Um, the bad bits led me to uh, think that what was what what we, was needed was was more space for visually impaired uh, performers and creatives to be able to work things out in in our own way and see what was really interesting um, and exciting about um, our our kind of bodies on stage really and things we had to say and that's why I set up Extant. And all of my directing um, experience has come through um, the company. Um, there was one production at the very start where we, we brought in a director to work on that because I'd written, I'd written the adaptation of that and I didn't think it was healthy. I, in, the, in the production that I had been in prior to setting up Extant, I had worked with somebody <laughs> who not only had written the play, was, was starring in it and also was directing it as well. And it, that was one of the reasons why I think that the experience was bad. So I knew that I didn't want to do that um, with our first production. Um, but after that, the ideas for the company uh, were getting were, were, were quite experimental. 
and it was hard to think of people to really bring in to <laughs> to work on them um and there was a, there was a production that Alex and I worked on called Sheer back in 2012 <laughs> uh, <laughs> where we did actually I was I was trying to um trying to do the thing that I had kind of um pledged I would do which was to to not write the shows for the company anymore and we brought in a visually impaired writer for that and um uh, like I say the, the idea the, the kind of concepts that we wanted to sort of push the envelope on were so bizarre that that kind of relationship didn't really work out and so in the end we we had a tour that was books and ready to go and we had to produce a script so Alex came in as dramaturg uh, I slung a script together uh, and that's what we worked on <laughs> oh my goodness and it's been a bit a bit like that ever since really um it's you know extant for me has been like the way that I have been able to uh uh flex I guess you know my creative muscles and I don't know if anybody else would give me that opportunity uh, I'm not necessarily being interested in directing as as such it's always been about the ideas and um and then if and then if I'm the one who has to kind of push those ideas through somehow you know and I'm, I'm not the greatest director in the world I know that I, I I don't have many tools in my kit bag I if someone doesn't do it right people will you know any any actors that work with me and they do come back it's not that they don't come back they do come back <laughs> but they just say that my my they wanted to get t-shirts printed up which was like you know that was a bit crap can you do it better which is just not the thing that you say to an actor um maybe I should have gone and got some training but anyway um it's been a fantastic ride um not I think that setting up your own company is was one way of doing it um and I think I just shielded me from from being out there in a big bad world and um you know having to do that thing of of, of knocking on doors and stuff so I know I've been in a very privileged place um and uh thank you that's I think that's all I've got to say for now <laughs> I'll bow out, bow out. I'm turning my camera off. Thank you, Maria. That's lovely. Um, I think it's really interesting to hear the kind of the realness um, of your journey and how you came to where you are today. So welcome everyone. Um, Amy's just joined. Welcome everyone now in the room. Um, a little reminder, any questions for Maria or our other three upcoming panellists, it's jamie, J-A-M-I-E, at extant.org.uk. So it now gives me pleasure uh, to welcome Rod, who is going to uh, now give us a new perspective um, on his journey as a director. Um, so Rod, when you are ready, the floor is yours. Don't start the clock yet, because I don't know whether anyone can help. I'm about to show how dim I am. <clears throat> a white block has appeared on my screen, which may be telling me that it's being recorded and I don't know how to make it go away. Yes, I find are. that if I make it go away, I'll kind of bugger up the whole... You go away as well. Yeah. yeah, that I'll go away. <laughs> Shall I just leave it? I'll put up with it. Right, we can um, see you, OK. We, uh, we can hear you. We can... OK, yeah. terrific. Yeah. Um, right, Caroline, you can start the clock. Yep. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, everyone. <laughs> I'm Rod Dungate and uh, I'm really a, a director and writer and creativity person and um, also a teacher. Um, you can check me out later if you want to www.rodungate.uk. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about myself, which I forgot to do. I'm an older white man. Um, and I'm sitting in my study at the moment, Grandy called my study, and I don't have colour coordinated books behind me. The shelves look like a mess and you can put a capital M there. Um, so I'm going to tell you a bit about myself. Uh, then I'm going to spend a bit of time on some of the things that I found helped me when I'm directing. Um, and then at the end, I'm going to talk to you about the project I'm at present involved in because it, it, it's a real life example of some of the things I'll be talking about. So uh, I am older and I directed my first play in, when I was 17, my first play with adults when I was 17. God knows how I got away with it, but I did. And 
I've carried on since. I've worked, I've directed adults, both amateur and professional, and I've directed children. Um, and I've also uh, ta taught youngsters and most recently done a lot of um, teaching at uh, the drama school in Birmingham. I'm based in Birmingham, which is grandly called the Royal Birmingham Conservatoire, um, teaching undergraduate and postgraduate actors and, and for a time designers as well. Um, and I took quite a number of years off in the middle of all that, believe it or not, to run the office for a politician. So, you know, they said to me, are you going to find a seat for yourself? And I said, no, I can't wait to get back to the real world of theatre. So that's what I did. Um, so that's that's where I'm at. Um, I have to say about directing, I think it's the most wonderful thing to do. I, I love doing it. I think maybe I'm very bossy or something, but I love organising things. And I think directing is about the most terrific and wonderful and exciting thing that you can do. Um, I'll just run through a few of the things that really work for me as a director. And the first one I think is very important. If you're working, most of the work I've done has, has been with, with scripts. Um, sometimes classic scripts, uh, you know, Shaw as well, modern scripts and new writing as well. As a director, you have to know that script. You have to know inside out, upside down and left and right. Um, you cannot be caught out on the script. You need to know your way around it. And if it's a historical script, don't get caught out when an actor says, I don't understand what that word means. You should know. Um, so uh, know your play, really know it. Know it as a piece of literature as well. Know how to understand what the big idea is behind the text. What's the writer trying to say? Know about the writer, even if it's a new new script. You know, talk to the writer and find out about them, what they're trying to say. What are you trying to say with the production as well? The big idea works like a focus. It's like a searchlight that, that shines and makes everything work. I think the thing that's really worked for me in terms of the text is to divide it up into units. And strictly speaking, if you do it really strictly on the Stanislavski method, you put a new unit every time someone comes in or goes off because the dynamic changes each time. I've sort of varied that a little bit and I, I'm a bit more flexible with it. But I organize my whole rehearsal around units, you know, because it's easy to call units as rehearsals you know, units seven to 10, that kind of thing. The actors get to know where they are. You mark them up with the actors at the beginning. That's very boring, but that's fine. And the actors then give it, give them titles. Oh, that's the ham sandwich section. Ah, oh, that's the swing doors section. And you often find that that title gives you a key into that unit. It's really canny. So that's the first thing, know your script. I think the second thing is, know how actors work, understand how actors work. Um, if they're doing psychological realism and it's hard to get away from it, even if you're doing something very stylized, actors will have top of the scene objectives. They'll have objectives. Those objectives will be run with obstacles and strategies and so on. It's not your job to give those to the actors. That's their homework. They should do that. But knowing how they work can be a very good shortcut, a quick shorthand when you're discussing with them, particularly if you want to change the rhythm of a scene or something like that. Later on, if someone asks, I'll, I'll talk about actioning lines of dialogues, which is very, very helpful, but I won't give that go into that now. So that's the other thing, know how actors work. The other thing is respect the actors and really understand they are creative artists in their own right, and they will bring their creativity to it. Now, normally, what I didn't say earlier on, by the way, is that my site began to go about six, seven, eight years ago, and I wouldn't admit it. And it's gone downhill in the recent years, and I've ended up thinking I'll never be able to direct again until now. Um, so I would have said, don't look at your script in rehearsals, watch the actors. Now I've got to redefine watch the actors to myself. I've got to find a way of doing that. But spin off them, 
they are in the scene in a way that you will never be as a director. So spin off them, get the ideas from them. They will create the ideas. They're creative artists that respect them. Don't publicly tell an actor off. Sometimes the notes you give can be public. Sometimes they need to be quietly spoken into the ear of an actor because actors are very vulnerable when they're in rehearsal. They're working on their emotions. I've told undergraduate actors when I was teaching, I will only put actors down on for one reason, one reason only, and that's if they are rude to the stage management, and I won't have that. You know, the stage management support actors and support us as directors, and they don't get any of the glory, so you don't put them down. I won't allow actors to do that, and mostly they don't. Actors are gorgeous. I love actors. I love being around actors. I fall in love with all actors. So they're terrific. The next thing is um, uh, know a bit about everything. Know a bit about lighting, know a bit about sound design, know a bit about set design, because you can then have a discussion with those artists. They're creative artists as well. One of the fantastic things about directing and writing playwrights, I'm also a playwright and a poet, is that all this stuff comes into what you're doing. It's fantastic. So have a little bit. And if someone wants a little funny story about that, ask me afterwards, I'm going to whiz on, all right? The last one is, and this was told to me by a director I was working with as an actor. He said, create an atmosphere where creativity can take place. Now, the rehearsal space isn't a democracy. You are in charge, you're the top of the pyramid, but you respect everybody. So do respect everybody, take their ideas, listen to them. But at some point you have to make a decision and if you're trying to discuss something with an actor, the last thing you want is 15 other actors chipping in with ideas because the poor actor doesn't know what to do. So you need to manage the situation. That's hard. It's hard being manager, but you need to manage it. But that's part of the thrill as well. And I love it's just lovely. I love it. And the last thing about creating an atmosphere where creativity takes place, make a lot of laughs have jokes, have laughs, laughter is creative. I was talking to a colleague of mine the other day who's a, I, she's a theatre nurse, which makes everybody think she's a nurse attached to a theatre. No, she's in an operating theatre in a hospital as a theatre nurse. And she said, consultants, listen, if a nurse spots something, they are trained to speak up. So they have ideas, but the consultant is in charge, but he or she will listen to what the ideas are. And if something stops, you know, someone's working on a bleed or something needs to be changed, Stacy said to me, the consultant then says, right, come on, someone tell us a joke. And this can be in the middle of an operation. So laughter is important there as well, but laughter is really important. How am I doing for time, Caroline? Yes, I think you've got one minute left, Rod, oh. maybe a minute and a half. I, I might steal it. All right, so moving forward, it's really hard, it's really hard. You probably already know that. Just keep directing. The hard thing is that if you want to do a fringe show, which is very useful, you know, the actors can come and be in your show, but the problem is you're likely to have to set the show up. So it's really hard work. Go whatever ways you can. Try not to direct scripts that aren't very good. I've made that mistake. So try not to do that. Do good scripts, um, but keep at it. And the last thing is network. Keep your network going. Your network is really, really important. And there's a thing that we do in this business. When we're feeling down, when we're feeling depressed, when we haven't got any work, we don't phone anybody up because we think they're all learning millions of pounds. That's the very time when we should be phoning people up because they'll keep you going. They'll boil, boil you up. So I'm now going to finish just a little bit on general guidance to explain something to you. When I thought I'd never direct again, I, I was still writing. I and I wrote what I did was what I did was to write a a set of poems, a big set of poems, which was about me losing my sight, how I felt about it, how I was changing my identity. Then the second half of it was was training with the guide dog, with a guide dog. And uh, I think Maria's, uh, I think none of the guys from Extend have actually read it. Uh, well done, all of you. 
Um, I hope there are a few laughs at it. It's very serious. It was very intense. It was the hardest thing I'd ever written. But I didn't know who to show this to because I was really nervous. It was so honest and, and so on. And I was, felt very exposed. So I sent it to a friend of mine, part of my network. I directed him when he was first at university. I was a mature student. And I'd always get in touch with him. He later ran the Gateway Theatre Chester and he commissioned a play off me, then went off to Scotland. And he read this set of poems and it was him who saw it as a theatre piece. And he said, this would work as a piece of theatre and gave me a set of notes about how to make it work. So I thought that's interesting. So I went back to my network and I'd had a student, an MA acting student who was vision impaired. And that was what his research project was about. He went off to become a disabilities officer in Sheffield. So I went to my network, I sent it to Ben. And Ben came back and he said, this is terrific. It's so honest, you know, that it's absolutely terrific. You know, make a great theater piece. So by this stage, I thought, well, maybe there's something in it. So I then went to someone else in my network, someone called Danny, who is just a lovely person. I, I don't know whether Maria knows Danny or knows of Danny, but it was Danny who put me in. Yes, touch. yes, and so does Alex. Right, and it was Danny who was just gorgeous, absolutely gorgeous. Man. He put me in touch with Grey Eye and with Extan, and it's Extan, and I learned from, I think Maria said in an email, or it may have been Caroline or uh, Louisa who said, oh, we've got a direct pathway. And I thought, oh my goodness, there are other directors who can't see. You know, that's brilliant. And I suddenly thought, well, maybe I can learn. So my journey is going to be how to, how to rework what I know in terms of having my, my vision inability now and, and seeing how I can work it and working with the guys at Extend, I think we've got a potential pathway fingers crossed you know working with the Arts Council you know it's always dodgy and difficult isn't it but we've got a pathway and I feel I feel for them for the first time in years when I was losing my confidence I now feel confident that I can do this I can do it I'm going to finish up by saying one thing, which I've already said, because why not repeat it if it's worth saying? I think directing is the most wonderful thing to do in the world. It's possibly the only thing I might disagree with Maria about. But oh, I just love it. I, I think it's wonderful. So good luck to all of the people who, who, are, who are finishing that course at the end of the director's course. Really good luck to you i really wish you well and i don't care if your competition to me you know you might be better than me quite possibly will be good luck to you i finished thank, <laughs> thank you rod and i think you know there's space for everyone there is no competition we will just shine our light in the <laughs> we all help each other don't yeah. we yeah that's the thing yeah, yeah. 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 Great. Thank you. Um, so welcome to anyone that's turned up in the last 10 minutes. Um, so, so far we've had Maria and Rod. Um, it, it now gives me brilliant pleasure to welcome Shola onto the Zoom stage. Um, Shola is an award-winning writer, director and producer. So we will now change the spotlights. Hi there. And I think the mute's on at the moment. Yeah. After all our period of time of the uh, uh, pandemic, we uh, we still have to say, <laughs> unmute yourself. It's easily done, yeah. <laughs> yeah it's one of Thank those you. Joys. Good evening, everyone. My name is, and I love saying my whole name, is Olushola Oyeleye. I love my name. Um, it's a Yoruba name from Nigeria, um, but you're just calling me Shola. I'm a writer, a theatre director, producer, and I've worked in theatre, uh, in dance. I've worked in the West End as a resident director. Um, I've also worked in visual arts. I love working with music. And I also have had a wonderful, uh, you know, career uh, in education. So I am currently a senior lecturer in acting in at a university in London but I've also taught in other universities around the world 
And that, I think, is a really interesting uh, process. I thank all the speakers who've come before. Uh, it is really interesting to expand yourself and dream and want to tell stories and not allow anybody to limit what you want to do. Stories are like, I guess, babies in some way. Writing is like a baby, production is like a baby, and you birth it in whichever way, and then you have to nurture it, nurture it to production with hopefully a lot of creative people around you to realize it. And as people have spoken before, it's not something that you do on your own. And so that teamwork is really important. And I've been very blessed to work with designers that I've worked with repeatedly. Um, that's how it happens. You have teams of people who understand that the work is the most important thing. That's the core of everything that we do. I'm really happy to be here. Uh, my connection, as some of you uh, begin to realize, is through Maria. I'm going to out us. We went to school together. Uh, and uh, 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 I'm really proud of that. So really? I'm, I'm, okay. I'm, 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 <laughs> That's a true. <laughs> the network. <laughs> Where, wherever, wherever I can. I a time a few uh, weeks ago reminiscing and trying to catch. I'm incredibly proud of what she's achieved and I've had the opportunity to walk on that journey with her, um, as she said, producing her second play, Blood, Sweat and Fears. Um, Blood, Sweat and Fears, actually, get the, get the name right. Um, so, um, so about me, I like telling stories and I started my journey uh, as a writer. When I started writing, it was a period of time when dramaturgs or literary managers were deciding, and they're still doing it now, but not as rigidly as they did then, telling us what they thought the audience wanted to see. And so therefore, a play by a black writer, a black woman writer that might want to write about her African heritage or her heritage of being brought, born and brought up in the UK and those kind of stories was not what they thought their audience wanted to see. And what I could see was that it wasn't about the quality of my writing, it was the subject matter. So the seed there was sown about dramaturgy, about the idea that I could work with a writer to help them realize their story in the form that they wanted to realize it. We have very many styles of theater today. We have gig theater, which is like lots of music and dance and noise and movement. We have traditional three act structures, Aristotelian kind of like plays. We have one act plays, uh, monologues and all sorts of uh, plays. And now these things are, people are more receptive, if you like, to the different kinds of stories, the, the diversity and inclusivity of stories. But there was a time, and there still is somewhat, when people would dictate to you about who they, what they thought their audiences wanted to see. Ultimately, an audience wants to see a good play. And it's almost like being, uh, the way I kind of recognized it was as if to say, uh, you tell a child, you'll try and introduce them to new food and they say they don't like it before they've even eaten it. So what you'll find is that there are lots of gatekeepers in this profession who will try and block your path and tell you what is aesthetically pleasing and what is de rigueur, what is the style of the day, what topic matters you should be writing about. Um, but you, you have to stay true to the stories you want to tell. And Honestly, they will always out at the end of the day. They will always uh, be realized. And that vision that uh, Maria had about wanting to create uh, a theater company that tells stories and that you know works with people who are blind and visually disabled, she had that vision and she realized it. There wasn't anything before that. So you have to create your space. What is your vision? What is the space you want to occupy? 
And I think that's a really important question as a director because you have to bring on the material and the people to work with you. What is your vision? And what are the stories you want to tell? And who do you want to tell them with? You might be a writer director, in which case you're writing and directing your work and bringing on all the creatives that need to make that project happen. But you, we all occupy a space in this earth, in this universe, and nobody can tell me as a creative what space I should or should not stand in. And you have to be incredibly determined to make your mark. It doesn't matter whether the work is good in inverted commas or relevant or not relevant. You are creating a space to tell the stories you want to tell. And you have to be determined uh, to do that. So that's something I think is really important. Um, Rod spoke earlier about, you know, having some knowledge of the different aspects of uh, different crafts. And I do agree with him that one thing that I won't tolerate is rudeness towards the technical uh, staff. Why? Because I was a stage manager once myself. <laughs> so I know, <laughs> so <laughs> know exactly what it's like to be on that. Uh, the end of the process and you'll find that quite a lot of directors uh, may have had some technical uh, aspect to their work they might be interested in sound they might be interested in you know lighting they might be interested in so many different areas or just props and so forth um, but what that does is it gives you a real sense of the stage the other thing that I also did, like Maria, is I trod the boards. Mm. I was an actor. Um, I didn't, I wasn't passionate about being an actor, but I did understand the importance of uh, understanding and going through that process of being able to learn a role, to develop it, to bring into the room my ideas, but also to subsume them where it was, where it was important to what the director's vision was. And one of my few claims to fame is that I was the central character in David Yates' first short film for TV. I'm gonna put it out there. <laughs> uh, and uh, most of you will know him from directing the Harry Potter films. Well, I was there to begin with. I was <laughs> the first one. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> so, uh, it, what that does though, it gives you a real sense of the vastness, the teamwork behind putting a play on. You can't be selfish as a director. Sometimes you have to draw ideas from so many different places. And, and sometimes you have to be humble because as much as it is important to know your script inside out, the reality is somebody will come up with an idea that you have not thought of and yeah. you don't know everything and that's why it's teamwork and so a lot of humility although leadership is important humility is also important there are some directors who are dictators and there are some directors who work in a more collaborative way one is not better than the other but some projects uh, require a different kind of uh, leadership and collaboration, a different kind of nurturing to uh, make them realize. The other thing that I think is also quite important is if you have the opportunity to go abroad and either sit in rehearsals or go to different parts of the country and sit in somebody's rehearsal, that can also be really enlightening and revealing. So I trained at Le Coq, uh, Le Col Jacques Le Coq, uh, in Paris. That was my fake French accent. I hope you will appreciate that. <laughs> and, um, and I learned a lot uh, because I'm quite physical in my own practice. And then uh, when I came back, I had the opportunity to uh, be the first Black director working at English National Opera, first Black staff director there. So I got to learn about working on a vast stage 
and that vastness and that wonderful expense you can bring into the small spaces. So I think what I'm saying here is go and knock on doors. Be open. Don't think, oh, I don't like that. I'll never have an opportunity to work there or, or whatever. You could be the first to open that door. Sometimes you're the person that makes other people realize, oh, you know, oh, maybe we should be doing this or maybe we should be opening up the door. And I know sometimes that can feel as if to say it's tokenistic, but you really have to go out there and say, I want to take this space. And I say to my acting students, take the space. <laughs> Nobody has the right to tell you that you cannot take the creative space. So take that space. Visit different places. Go and see an opera. Listen to it. Ask if you can sit in a rehearsal room and, and, and get a real sense of the intimacy, but also the enormity of it. Some ask if you can just go and sit in a dress rehearsal or a stage rehearsal or a sit proba where the actors are the opera singers are singing, because you may not think that you will ever direct an opera, but why wouldn't you? There are some beautiful stories that can be told through music and through sound. So um, open up doors for yourself by uh, demanding that you enter those spaces. It's so, so important. Don't limit yourself, dream. Dream, dream, and make those dreams become a reality by being present, by taking the space that's available to you. Our, our creativity is littered with projects that never happened. People who didn't realize various things in their lives and their careers because gatekeepers uh, closed doors to them. I'm asking you as the next generation of directors to smash those doors down. Yeah, I'm being a rebel. Smash the doors down, demand your space, take your ideas and your stories. Nobody has heard the stories that you want to tell. We're all human beings, but I'm, I have stories, you each have stories that nobody knows yet. And the power of theater is that we can create those stories, put that down as a legacy for generations of young people to come and adults to come. So tell your stories, take your space, take your dreams and realize them. Thank you. Thank you very much, Shola. Oh, that was brilliant and really inspiring and something for us all to ponder on. Um, so um, a little reminder, we are emailing jamie at extant.org.uk if you have a question for Shola or for Maria or for Rod. Um, we are now going to pass to our fourth and final panellist, which is Alex. Um, so welcome to the Zoom stage. Alex, um, once you've put your camera on, we can um, we will spotlight you in your own time, no rush at all. Um, thank you, Alex. And I'll I'll kind of chip in in about eight, nine minutes, if that okay, works. Okay, good. But, yeah. but do take your time. Thank you. Okay, thanks very much. Wow, well, that was wonderful to hear all three, uh, Maria, Rod, and Shola speaking. Um, I, 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 rather than repeat, because a lot of things that have been said, I would absolutely echo, but I'll, um, I'll just add in a few things that, um, will build on on the great things already said um and also just a, a just a brief um bio i i um i've been working for over 30 years and um i started in canada and i was the only disabled in the village <laughs> <laughs> um, um and uh i after two years of being in theater school studying as an actor as my vision was started to deteriorate i just thought okay that there's no future here um so i went to england to train to be a voice teacher and while i was there um someone told me about gray eye theater company and at first i just thought oh no 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 that's those are <laughs> other people <laughs> those disabled people are other people um and then it took, you know, I finally uh, changed my mind and in two minutes of working with um, the wonderful people at Grey Eye in those days, back in 1990, I never wanted to work with um, non-disabled people ever again. <laughs> um, and also during that year, I saw this brilliant play, Hound, 
um, written by you, Maria. <laughs> and I thought, oh, look at that. Like blind people can be actors too and writers. And it just like my world blew open. Um, and, you know, I, I think for all of you in this Zoom room right now, you have got the power of each other. And I cannot reinforce enough how important that is. Um, I, I, I met Maria about six years later. Um, I believe it was at a, a workshop, an opera workshop. <laughs> um, and the two of us spent most of the time laughing and um, cracking each other up. But it was such a, it was a amazing moment for me to 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 get to know Maria um because you know up to that point I really had felt that I was pretty much also the only blind in the village um and a community really makes a difference so build on the relationships that you have right now um because you've been working with extant um, because there are other blind and visually impaired artists that you know in the community. Um, I think sometimes we forget how important community is and um, it, it, will, it, it, will, it will get you through those difficult moments. Um, and, and it will also, and also we will, we will, we will piss each other off. We, we you know, it's not, it's not all sunshine and glee. Um, but we 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 really need each other, and I and I really want to reinforce the need to to um, yeah to try and to take care of each other and remember um, how valuable we are to each other. Um, just a few things. Oh, I guess I haven't finished my story. I got I got stuck on meeting Maria, and you see what happens when you meet Maria. You just can't move on. Um, I then uh, uh, I went I, I worked in Canada until 2003 and then came back to the United Kingdom with a play that I had written called Smudge, which was based on my sight loss. And then I stayed in the United Kingdom and worked with um, Grey Eye for a number of years as the, uh, I developed a, a new writing program for them called Write to Play. Um, and uh, and I had the amazing opportunity to work with Maria on a few projects and if you want to talk about laughter in a, a rehearsal space Rod I have never laughed so hard as when the we worked on that burlesque play Maria I, I just <laughs> we laughed so hard and the great thing about that project was it was based purely on the the idea of play and mm -hmm. it's something that I've taken forward in all my work ever since, because it really was, I think, one of my favorite projects of all time. The need for play. You know, we, we yet yeah, creating theory, theater is a serious business, but making great theater requires a constant uh, um, return to play. That sense of freedom. And if you can create spaces where your actors feel free to play, then I think you are you're, you're creating truly brilliant um, creative spaces. And how do you do that? Well, I do that. I I I I use a lot of improvisation in my um, rehearsal room, regardless of whether there's a script or no script. Um, it, it, bringing people back to that to the idea that they're trying to discover something rather than something being handed to them so that would be a, a, something to add to the conversation so far is that whether there's a script or not remember to play remember to keep the idea of discovery um and searching alive in your room um so yes, I worked with Extant. Um, then I started my own um, theater company called Invisible Flash, um, which um, uh, I guess we had a, a couple of projects before I then uh, moved back to Canada. And I've been here for five years. I'm happy to say I'm going to be returning to the UK as well as working in Canada. And I am um, currently uh, developing uh, a new piece here about blind travel writing. Um, a couple of other things to throw in just in terms of approaches to directing as a blind director. Um, I love, I, I, I love bringing in to 
everyone's process, whether they are blind or sighted actors. Uh, things I've learned uh, as a person who has become blind and things I've learned from my process that I think are valuable to everyone. So one thing that I have learned that I have to do um, uh, as a person who's blind, who doesn't have the immediacy of sight when I walk into spaces, um, is that um, spaces emerge. You know, as a sighted person, spaces were immediate. They were apparent. I could see them with my eyes. It took no time at all. But was I really aware of the space I was in? Had I actually explored it? And what I love about entering a rehearsal space as a blind person is that the space emerges. I have to discover it. I have to take the time. I have to walk around. I have to really understand the space through my body, through my ears, through my feet. And I ask all my actors to do that. And it, every actor I've ever asked to do that has always said that it has changed their, um, their physical relationship to where they are. And they, they feel more inside the room. And that's so key. You want your actors to embody the space. And I also think space is a great, uh, it's almost like a character. It's this wonderful character that we often forget about. So that's, uh, so I say, I, I would suggest that, you know, really um, get your actors to explore the space. Um, as an actor, I use line feeding when I am um, working on a new script, which means that somebody is um, speaking the lines to me and then I say them out loud. I get all my actors to do that. And again, it, I've had actors say that it, they hear the words rather than see them on the page. And I ask them to wait until they're really ready to say that line. And if they have to hear it again and again before they say it. So we do scene work through line feeding. And again, you know, that's a technique um, that, I, that I would say, you know, I've come to through just my own need as a blind actor. Um, I also really love to ask actors to, um, speak their st their actions and stage directions to take ownership of their stage directions when we're doing table work table work being when we're we're reading plays out loud and it's just again it's a reminder that this is physical theater is physical um so those are just some of my i guess directing tips but um i i just want to throw in a, a few philosophical <laughs> survival uh, uh techniques um, that I've found helpful along the way as a, as a person who many times was, uh, felt very alone um, and, and needed to remind myself, why am I doing this? You know, ask yourself, you know, when you, when you come to those places of saying, why bother? Actually sit down and, uh, and answer the question, why am I doing this? It's really hard. You know, when I, when I ask myself, why bother? All I have to think about is um, that, it is very similar to what Shola said. Um, I bring, uh, I am endlessly interested in what the experience of being blind brings to the theater. And there are very few of us who can do that. So that's one of the reasons I bother. And I also bother because I haven't run out of things to say and I haven't run out of questions and I haven't run out of believing that um, there are more and more um, ways that theater can be shaped and reshaped and reimagined from a blind perspective. So I guess my answer to why bother is because um, there's the work is uh, is is vital and uh, and I'm not finished. So ask yourself why bother? Here's another great question. Ask yourself what going well means. You know, it's not going well for me right now. You might have that feeling. I'm having a hard time. So what does not having a hard time look and sound like to you? And what is amazing when I ask myself, you know, what does not having a, a, a what is having a, what is having a good time? What is going well look like, sound like? I often realize it's just that I'm working with the wrong people. It, it, it may just mean that I have to say no and get out of the scarcity model of saying yes to things I probably really don't want to do. And so it's that's not hard. Just say no next time and find uh, the right people to work with because they, they're they out there. And I, I often find that the answer to why things are not going well is simply because I, I need to be working with um, 
with different people. Um, and the other question is, um, uh, how far are you um, from where you want to be? Um, and I have also found that I'm, I'm usually not far off. If I think about things too much in the future, then I'm far off. But if I actually think, what do I want to achieve this year, as opposed to where do I want to be in five years, that age old question, where you want to be in five years, that never works for me. I just need to think about where do I want to be at the end of this year. So for me, that's a much um, better way of thinking about things. Low hanging fruit is so useful. So reach out to the people that you know and take advantages of the opportunities that are not that far away from you. Um, the advantages of working with a company is it's great because you have community around you, but the disadvantages are that you often have to work to somebody else's mandate. So just be, just be clear about that. If you want to work within a company, is that the mandate you want to work towards? Um, and if you, if you want to work as an individual, get to know the funding that's out there for you, get to know the support systems that are available for you stay connected to your community and incubate and fertilize. Now that may sound like I'm saying have a lot of sex. <laughs> what I'm actually talking about is um, fall, fail, take the advantage of those moments to incubate and use those moments as fertilizer. Turn your failure into fertilizer. Um, and don't be afraid of failing. I was afraid of failing so many times because I just thought, well, you know, I'm blind. I represent, you know, do I represent all blind people? No, I don't. <laughs> Is this the only opportunity I'm going to have? No. So try to take the pressure off yourselves and use failure as an incubation period. Um, and I think that's it. Oh, and be shapeshifters. I think that's what Shola was saying. Rather than fit into a shape, shift shape. Um, fit in or fuck off just doesn't work anymore. There's no, we, we have the power to change the rooms, change the process. Um, so yeah, take advantage of your shape shifting magic. Thank you so much to Alex. Okay, so um, we're just on eight o'clock. What we're gonna do now, we're gonna take a two minute comfort break. Um, when we come back, we will look at the questions and any questions for Maria, Rod, Shola or Alex. Um, so I've been writing a few little notes and we've been talking about, you know, having a vision, building your network, creating your space, knocking down doors, um, being humble, treating everyone with respect. That is anyone and everyone in the room and looking at um, the play and the sense of community. And that is just a few words uh, from the really lovely presentations this evening. Purple background, white text. Audience questions. So basically, I'm just going to put that to the four panellists and um, ask mm -hmm. if anyone would like to chip in with that, really. So ageism is, is, is out there, unfortunately. Um, is there any ideas, especially drawing from your presentations this evening, um, to, to respond to Paula's question? Um, so I think it's fine if you just speak up. I think there's, there were not too many in the room, so we won't talk over each other. I think I'd like to just offer yes. um, a, 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 a word of um, advice. There are so many isms that people put in the way. I think sometimes what we have to do is learn a language. Could you just speak, speak a little bit louder, please? Yes, I will. Can you hear me, Robert? Yeah, that's much Can better. You Thank you. Great. Thank you. Um, I think that it's really important to find your space in the room and say to people quite boldly, call them out and say, that, you know, or even write that I do not have or have not had the opportunities that other people may have had. That's not being self-deprecating. That's not, uh, you know, making excuses. It's saying that I am in a demographic that uh, is creative, but needs to have space. So make space for me. Mm, okay. Thank and, you. And, uh, and, and, and I think that ageism is something that's, you know, it's, it's prevalent every, in every factor of our lives. Um, 
it just makes me it makes me really annoyed and upset you know that because how can you don't know how people how long people are going to live you know and you don't know what they're going to be able to offer and as a director coming to creativity at the particular point in your life gives you a rich tapestry to draw on mm. so you know, pick the organizations that you want to uh, be involved in and say, make the space for me. Okay. In the first instance, just getting in the room is important. Okay, thank where, you. Where are you based, Paula? Well, I, I live in, I, yeah, thank you, I, I live in Watford. Oh, right. Um, actually, I'm, I think I'm gonna say something fairly similar. It's the advantage of living in Watford is that you've got all those companies fringe companies small companies in london and so on mm. and search out some that you think have got a good record and actually phone them up which i think is a not as elegant way of putting it as as finding your space in the room but ring them up and say can i sit in on your rehearsals okay i'm new to this you know and then play all the cards you've got and i i i feel awful doing this i really do feel bad but i do it I put on applications, you know, or I put in letters or something, you know, I am vision impaired, you know. Mm. To, I mean, for God's sake, you know, there are enough disadvantages to it. Why not use the advantages as well and see if you can then get into the room and begin to build up a network that way and build up your confidence in that way. OK, thank you. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah. And I'm just I'm, I'm just curious. What what sorts of things do people say to you that are um, making you feel discouraged? Um, I think because I've applied for stuff, and I go to apply, I go to apply for like for assistant director um, residential posts, and um, and a lot of things are for young, you know, young directors, yeah. young, see, news, young that. I, and I think I mean, I personally, I think older people have got an enormous amount to Absolutely. say. I, I see. And, okay. Yeah. And I think, you know, older people's lives are really rich um, mm. and there's an awful lot in there. But then when I do apply, I don't get a response. Yeah. Absolutely. Now, yeah. now, it could mean some of it could be that, you know, I'm not great at selling myself either. So the part of it could also be that. But yeah. I'm always very conscious that when I do apply, yeah. that there's always that a question about your age, and I sort of think I wish they didn't. Wish, I wish they wouldn't ask it because they didn't Actually, ask this it. This is this is no use, yeah. to you, but they shouldn't yeah. actually be asking that. Yeah, yeah. Not I mean, it's no point. help that they've asked it, is it? But they shouldn't be asking it. It's shocking. Then, yeah. yeah, I think oh, are you. Oh, are you, are you talking about equal opportunities monitoring forms, Paul? Yeah, yeah, you don't yeah. actually have to fill oh, those in. Oh, on a monitoring form. You, you oh. should have um, to yeah, fill those as in. As somebody that's dealt yeah. with them, they don't. They get kept separately to the application, so it wouldn't yeah. influence your application oh, at all. No. Yeah, 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 yeah. It should. Yeah, they shouldn't. Not on a just a general, unless there's a call out for some. You know, for uh, specifically for people under a certain age. But yeah, um, there's a lot of that. But I, but I yeah. but you know what what I what I like about what you're saying, and this is something that I often say to people, is like um, uh, turn exclusion into excitement. Like like get some people excited about what you're talking about because I'm already yeah. excited about what you're talking about. Mm. It's like well then okay, let's have a call out specifically for people over fifty. Mm. Or, you know, like, because I, I think you're absolutely right that, um, see, like, that more senior artists or senior people, um, uh, humans, um, have a lot to say. So mm -hmm. I think, yeah, I think, I think you're on to something. I would get, I would start I talking agree. about this and, and yeah, set yeah. something up. Yeah, well, I, I think, think you should preempt, preempt, um, preempt whatever it is, like Alex says, if you suspect that that might be what's going on in their minds, even if they do detect that, you know, maybe it's the language you use when you're writing or mm. something, they can pick it out. You, you know, then work on that to be, to, to, I mean, you said about the thing about pitching, but you know, there, just take everything that you, uh, you've got, you represent the stories you want to tell, like Shola was saying, and you you sell them to their kind of like um, most kind of uh, the, 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 the sort of the, the, to their advantage. Um, so if yeah. you if you think they're already got you know around the vision pen, around the age, around whatever it is, mm. you make that all a winner as far as they're concerned. You know, yeah. um, 
yeah. and what's what's unusual and unique and interesting about where it is that you are in your life yeah I mean because I, sort of, I sort of think that women women over a certain age are invisible already <laughs> but if you could find a company who are about to do a play about something you know something that yeah. you've picked up on and you can get in touch with them and say I see you doing something I'm really interested in this topic <laughs> you know could I come into your house and kind of flatter them as well, you know, mm. see if you getting into the room, it's Alex's phrase, I'm now nicking, so. Yeah, 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 I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna, now you said it, I'm going, I'm going to uh, look up some sort of smaller theatres and start writing yeah. into them and contacting them and saying them, saying yeah. to them I'd like to do some shadowing experiences or assistant director experiencing. Yeah. Um, can I just chip in? Can Paula. I just chip in one yeah. one more thing, please? Yeah. So, Paula, the Royal Shakespeare Company has a new artistic director yeah. uh, pairing there. Write to them and okay. say, "I I would like to sit in your rehearsals. I think that there is a space to do work." Uh, with visually impaired uh, people uh, it might be something that extant also wants to write in and say look hey we'd like to partner in a in a project but the point about it is, is that when you say when you actually you know go for the top go for the side go for the middle and go for the small and the large okay mm. but definitely be bold there isn't anywhere okay. the raw um <laughs> english national opera have just lost their funding sadly now, write to them. Say, I want to be inside the room. Yeah, yeah. You know, take a, you know, take that opportunity uh, to just, in the first instance, get inside the room, get in the building. You okay. know, right. Yeah, get people to know my name, isn't it? Really. Yeah, yeah. Thank, thank you. And you thank you very much. Thanks, guys. I guess it's about finding the right fit when it comes to which companies inspire you um, yeah. as well. Yeah. Because there's a lot out there, so just picking and choosing. Brilliant, that's some brilliant advice there. Um, so Amy, I think you had a question that you wanted to- Yeah, I guess, um, yeah. I think for me, like I'm very political in most aspects of my work <laughs> and there are compromises that you have to make to get work on. And like, you know, I recently was on attachment to a theater and I they were streaming a show that I wasn't comfortable with them streaming and I had a meeting with them about it and they were really receptive. Um, but then at the same time, I work at the other side of the things with casting and I'll get emails from people saying, oh no, I'm gonna pass on this because of what the characters say and about disabilities. Like, well, you know, it's what you bring to it, isn't it? Um, but like, yeah, so I guess, like, I guess, you know, where do you, where do you know when to compromise and change from within and where do you know when do you know just not to go there is this a question for any of the panelists amy yeah yeah, yeah. So to any of our panelists when do we compromise and when do we need to stick to our guns with what we're trying to do anyone want to respond well it's alex here i mean that that just like that is such a great question um and, you know, I don't know that I could say that, you know, I have the magic answer to it. Um, but coming back to what Shola was saying about um, um, know, you know, know what you're trying to say. I think Rod said it too. What's your vision? I said, um, you know, um, be a shapeshifter. So I think know, like making sure that you know what's at the core like what's essential, what's essential to the work, um, that may help you identify whether something is a compromise or whether it's actually just something you can let go of. Because compromise just, ooh, that feels so risky. But I, I just wonder if it's more a question about really digging into what it is you're trying to achieve. And maybe that helps clarify whether it's is something you can let go of. What was the thing, Amy, you said, did you say that, that characters say something that you don't approve of about this? Well, yeah, well, that, that was an example that I've heard from someone else. So I mean, for me, 
for, for me, like, um, yeah, the, the issue that I had with the theatre, they were streaming a show that, in my opinion, was very ableist and had non-disabled actors uh -huh. playing disabled roles. And, you know, my work is all about writing roles for disabled actors. So it seemed inappropriate that I was in their building while they were streaming that show. Um, so, but at the same time... And you raised it with them and they didn't take any notice, basically. Well, they, they, I had a meeting with them and they were very receptive to everything I had to say, but they didn't take it down. <laughs> um, but, um, you know, and like, and they, they were like, oh, yeah, the, um, yeah, obviously, if we were doing it now, we'd do it differently. It's like, would you? <laughs> um, but, yeah, like... I think uh, is they might do it differently because you'd spoken to them. Mm. Uh, if they were doing it now and if they when they next did a show you know they might they might do that differently yeah. uh, Maria did Mice you want to had an input to them oh I think I'm muted oh sorry no, I can no, I, oh sorry thank you yeah um no I am um, I agree with what Rod says that about you know um things sort of evolving but also I think that um Alex is right about about um, knowing what's important to you, mm. and there are times when you just you know that 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 you just you know that 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 the entrenchment of um, yeah. attitudes is so um, uh, against what your own lived experience is and your own sense of self respect that you you have to basically. You know, it's uh, something that you, you you know you have a red line, don't you? And you decide that that's that's it, and that's not that's not where I am at. And there and like um, it's been mentioned this evening that that you have your allies, and there are other you know the the in you know it, it is a small industry, but it's also a very big industry mm. as well in terms of creatives. Yeah. You know, yeah. and you you it's it's sometimes it's not worth it if you really feel compromised and unable to live with yourself um or uncomfortable and you can't even articulate the reason why mm. it's important to get out of that space because it's not safe so uh you know i would say you know don't risk it um and and come you know retreat regroup mm. and find your you know your own your own sort of community yeah. elsewhere mm -hmm. whoever they might be that make you feel good about what you're doing and, and see that yeah. experience you've just had as a positive one because you can say to yourself I have now learned that I'm not willing to compromise with this. Yeah. And that will help you move forward in, and, and you will feel positive about it. Where it doesn't make it any easier to live with, possibly, but, you know. Yeah. yeah. It, it's good. It's good you've moved on and found something out about yourself. Yeah. So I think we've talked about finding community, but being quite sort of specific about who our community is, and, and that's a journey in itself. Um, I'm aware of time, so um, with the floor is open um, for any further questions. You can speak up or put a little emoji or send an email, any which way, um, any questions for our panelists? I have a question for Rod. Yeah. I have to yeah, come I'll ask it about that. Uh, you said um, don't work with, with bad scripts, but um, isn't what's a good script and a bad script subjective? Uh, sorry, did you say what's how do you know the difference between a good script and a bad script? He said uh, it's a subjective, uh, yeah, isn't it? Subjective. Sorry, um, so, not always. <laughs> it, it is a subjective, <laughs> there are objectively <laughs> bad scripts. <laughs> Pardon? <laughs> There are some Caroline, do you want to repeat the question? So, yeah. so basically the question is, um, you talked about good and bad scripts, but isn't yeah. that a very subjective opinion? You know, yeah. like, yeah. It, it, it is subjective, but I, I know that I have directed plays when I was younger um, that weren't that good. And I, I really think, sh should I really have, have done that? Was was it a bad move to do it? And I suspect it was. Um, it's not the same as working with someone to, to, to in, you can work on people to develop, sorry, work with people to develop a script, but to just go into, but I think I was too eager to direct plays at one stage and would, would direct anything. And, and some things I think looking back on it, I, mm. I, you know, I would have been wiser not to have done it, that's all. Mm. But it's a subject, it is a subjective, uh, decision, uh, you know, as to whether it's a good script or a bad script. Um, if it's a very, very strong idea, 
then it, it would be worthwhile working with the writer and saying, can we just talk this through? You know, this is a really strong idea. Um, I, I suppose in having a bit of dramaturgy, but don't try and write the script for them. And then if you could if you could have a positive relationship and develop it with them, you, you'd have a better chance than jumping straight in. Does that answer your question? Uh, yeah, I think so. Yeah. Can I just can I just um, add something to that? Because what I'm listening to what Rod is saying is that I, I'm, sort yeah. of, I'm sort of hearing a little bit maybe what I was saying, which is that we you can say no, like like you don't have to, we, we don't have to take every project that comes our way. Mm. Yeah. So I guess and sometimes, I mean, it sounds like Rod, maybe you're talking about new scripts or new writing, but also there are the old classics which you could bring. And um, they were talking about these the, these untold stories and the way that you take your your perspective and maybe bring a new twist to an old to an old story or an mm -hmm. or an existing kind of play. Um, that's another another thing to do. So we know you know the script is good. Um, because it's a classic, but then, you know, it's even made better <laughs> by your your take on it. Yeah, there's a most brilliant example that the RSC have got redone. I mean, I saw it before the pandemic when they did it, and it's a Moliere play, at the, but it's called, in translation, it's called The Hypocrite, I think. Um, and they, the, the company that created uh, a comedy programme, South Asian, couple of writers they created a very funny program on the radio that went on television and they adapted this French classic <laughs> into Muslim Birmingham mm. and it is brilliantly funny and it has the danger that Moliere's script originally had which is what I think you're saying about reimagining mm. a, a, a script, and it's, if ever you get chance to see it, any of you guys, you'll laugh yourself silly at it, and it's so dangerous as well. But it's mm -hmm. brilliantly done. Not it's an exact example of, of revisioning and, and making the story yourself by looking mm -hmm. at it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so working with devising as well and recreating, like you say, yeah. Thank you, everyone. Um, do we have any more questions before we close for the evening? I've I've got a question, Caroline. Anthony, hi, Anthony. Yeah. So, so my question: um, a lot has been said about laughter and the power of laughter, um, especially mm -hmm. in the rehearsal room, making your actors feel comfortable, mm -hmm. um, creating that safe space. Um, I've only had this happen to me on two occasions, but. Um, there have been times where, um, whether it's a member of the production team or a designer or a, an actor, um, causing confrontation within a, a team. Um, as a person who, I'm, I'm definitely a listener. Um, mm -hmm. I don't shy away from confrontation at an absolute um, um, at an absolute must. But how do you, as directors, deal with with moments where where you face somebody who isn't actually willing to to use that phrase again, compromise? Isn't actually willing to explore, um, you know, other other ways? And and actually, in many cases, isn't actually willing to do the job that they're there to be <laughs> yeah. they're paid to do. I've, I have got something to say on that. Um, yeah, Maria. Yeah. Just to let you know, um, <laughs> just I like you, Anthony. I've had two two um, experiences of that, um, and uh, the first the first time was with with an with an actor who had really profound anger management issues, and the second time was with um, an actor again who um, is incredibly challenging, and um, I've never had to discipline anyone um, before, but I had to in that in that. In that instance and it it was so challenging for me as a director uh, this is the second occasion I had to bring every diplomatic skill in my in my body to bear on this process um, and one conversation wasn't enough it went on and on and I had to, it was like yeah I had to really hold the space for breakthrough and there were, you know, there were times when it felt like I'd got there. Um, I had conversations with the with this member of the of the company um, individually, 
together as a company, together as a group. I tried every which way. Um, and all I can say is you just, pr I just prayed. Can I tell you a story? Uh, this is fairly early on in my career. Um, and I had exactly that situation. There was a guy in it and he was just, just awful. And it, like Maria says, you end up praying, you know, and every <laughs> rehearsal, it was, it was awful. And it was, I've only lost my temper twice with actors in 50 years. And that was one of them, the, this guy. And then I went into theatre one day and his script was there and he dropped out. And this was like a Friday and we were due to open the next Friday. And I went into panic stations and I, I kind of then had to rethink how I would, he was playing the lead by the way. And I, I, I had to work out how to deal with it and I recast it. Uh, I moved people around and then brought someone new in. And then I went to the cast because they knew this had happened, that he, he dropped out. And I went to tell them that I'd solved it. Uh, and I thought they'd all be, you know, very sad and, and disappointed and worried, you know. So I crept into the room. They were bloody having a party. <laughs> <laughs> honestly they were so relieved you know by the rod having to sort it out yippee um but as maria says in, in awful occasions there is just nothing you can do about it except grin and bear it and hopefully the other actors will note that and put a word out and, and as a director you'd certainly never work with a person mm. again and if you know other directors you say look you know takes your choice but not easy but yeah pray thank you thank <laughs> you um well i can see we've got um hands up with tam and then paula um so tam did you have a question hi yeah. hello um yeah thanks for a really interesting uh, discussion um i'm aware that a lot of you um are writers and directors um uh, of different experiences in each and I'm kind of wondering on the panel's thoughts about how um I know Maria you've you've spoken about your experiences but how healthy is it to write and direct on, on the same project um can it be done or is it better to stay away to keep to, to kind of keep to one skill set if you've got experience of both that's an interesting question um, Shola or Maria, would you like to answer that? I've, I've spoken on that, but shall I, shall I uh, Alex or Rod? I, 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 yeah. I, I yeah. think it's a fantastic thing to write and direct your own project. Um, some of the most uh, mainstream uh, writer directors in uh, mainstream theatre write and nobody says to them that uh, they can't do it. Um, you know, it, it's, it's like, I, I, I keep using this analogy a little bit, but it suits me well to kind of use it. Um, it's about, I see our projects as birthing. Yeah. And that, you know, it doesn't matter how you birth or how you take care of or where the baby comes from, but you have to nurture that baby. And sometimes projects are so precious that you cannot hand them over to somebody else to carry. After you've nurtured it, written it, you know, taking care of it for such a long period of time, sometimes you, you need to hold on to it in order that it doesn't get destroyed. Because sometimes what happens with dramaturgs and literary agents, they try and mould your play into what they think their house uh, would want to see. And therefore it moves away from, you know, as far as even who your central characters can be, you know? So mm -hmm. if you have the skill set, or you just dream that that's what you want to do, go on that journey. I mean, it's inspirational that Maria said at the beginning, you know, oh, I'm a writer and then I started directing and, you know, well, it was a journey. Yeah, go on the journey and, and, and yeah. get people that you trust to work alongside you because they'll guide you, you know, for sure. If you have created a project, do it. The only thing that I would say that it can be challenging in, in, in the early stages of one's career is writing, directing, 
and acting in the no, film. Project. No, don't do it. Exactly. <laughs> I think I think that 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 you know is a different skill set uh, altogether. You do you definitely need a third eye in that project. Yeah, yeah. But to write yeah. and direct a project in which other people are acting in it, go for it. Okay, thank you. I used to, thank I started as a director and then actually when I was working with a politician, I started writing and did my playwriting masters uh, at the University of Birmingham because I'm based in Birmingham. Um, and then I wrote plays and worked with some terrific directors. Um, and then, then the directing urge came back and I kept thinking about Alan Aitborn, who always does the first production of his own plays. And I did, I'd always said, I will never direct my own plays. And then, you know, having worked for a politician, I did a U-turn um, <laughs> and did <direct. laughs> Thank you, thank you for getting the joke. You're very kind. Um, and um, did start directing my own work and I, I don't know who it was who was just speaking front you because know, I can't catch the yeah, name. Yeah, Cam, I think. Oh, oh, and uh, then, then it was Shola. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and, and you you do need a second. You know, you need you need someone. You know, you need a good team of actors that you know, or you need someone who's got a good to watch over your shoulder with the script to see whether the faults with your script rather than your directing. Mm. you need you need someone around you to be confident yeah. but i i love it i love it i love it i love it but i'm a but, maniac so building these uh, little teams of people that we trust seems like a really important way forward did um, alex I, want to say something i think alex wants to say something well i guess i was just going to say that it's always depended on the project for me because i've done yeah. both where i've written a play and directed it and i yeah. have also written a, a play and ask somebody else to direct yeah. it. And I really, really think it depends on the project. And I think yeah. you will know, you just will yeah. know, you, you'll know that this piece needs an outside uh, outside attention um, and, and you will simply know it by the project. But there's, it's a glorious thing to write and direct if it, that's the right thing for the project. Yeah. You'll know. I agree. Okay, so um, I've seen you, Paula, but we've got questions now from Ada, Lily and Stephen. So I think we're gonna have to go Ada, Lily, Stephen, final one from Paula and then close uh, for the evening. So Ada, um, you can put your camera on or not, up to you. And um, what would you like to ask or comment today? Yeah, um, I'll keep my camera off. Thank okay. you so much to the panelists. I found this so, I think this is the most interesting panel discussion I've been to today. I've actually really enjoyed myself. Um, so um, my question was, uh, I wanted to get all your thoughts on um, what do you think about disabled creatives um, reimagining pre-existing like famous scripts, like, I don't know, Wicked or Legally Blonde or something like that. As, like, <laughs> as like a disabled version or do you feel it's Blind. better to create our own work um new new works telling like our stories like creating brand new pieces new pieces instead of focusing on reimagining pre-existing things great question okay well i'll just i'll just say something really really quickly on that and that is um, again like alex said in the last answer which is um do both uh, and it depends on what it is that you want to say. So we we did it with the chairs, we took a pre-existing um, famous classic text and we reimagined it, you put in blind actors in there and it changed the whole dynamic of the piece. We've worked on new stuff um, as well, you know, new writing, um, devised um, and sort of specific induced pieces. So uh, yeah, uh, I think you just do whatever you want to do, do whatever yeah. you want to do. So either route is fine. Does anyone else want to respond to that one? Or we'll move to Lily otherwise. I just say horses yeah. for horses. Shola. What do you want to say? Horses for horses. And then make okay. a decision. Yeah. I'll just quickly say, um, so Romeo and Juliet, inspired by other stories, spawns West Side Story, spawns uh, a book called Noughts and Crosses, which then turns, it's by Mallory Blackman, that then turns itself into a TV series. There are no new stories. Yeah. But there are stories that are channeled through our own experiences, our own world vision, our own, uh, 
dream life. So, um, you know, if, if, if one of those musicals oh. inspires you, um, Wicked comes from another film, doesn't it? There was the Wizard of Oz, and so then it spawns something yeah. else. So, yeah. yeah, so so take your idea and see where it, you know, where it's where it uh, lands in your world vision, um, and and that's how stories are made. Yeah? yeah, there aren't any new stories; they're just stories that are spawned from world experiences, but they're told through your prism, and that's what makes them unique. Mm. Yeah. Great, great. So the world is your oyster adder by the sounds of it. You can take so many different routes there. Thank, thank, you. thank you. Thank you. And I like the love heart on your screen there. Um, over to Lily. Um, hi, I just wonder if any of you have had or have experiences with anxiety in directing and how and and how do you either overcome it or can you just deal with it in being a director? <laughs> Thank you, Lily. Uh, so, um, and yeah, it's Alex speaking. Yeah, um, I immediately just wanted to say yes. Um, and and also as a writer and as an actor, um, I. I I deal with my anxiety um, right up front, and I encourage everyone that I work with to do the same. Um, I just consider it a, a, like an access need. You know, it's like I need I need sighted guide to get around the room. Um, I might need to uh, just stop rehearsals at a certain time and have a 15 minute anxiety break. And I actually call them anxiety breaks or we schedule. One of the techniques I've used is to schedule, um, an anxiety session <laughs> at a certain time in the day. So everybody knows that if they're feeling really anxious at 10 30, they know that the anxiety session is coming up at 3 30 <laughs> and we all sit around the room for 20 minutes, feeling really anxious. And it's great. It's really fun. <laughs> You make each other laugh with your anxiety. Yes, we do. Yeah, and we talk about why we're all feeling anxious. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. I wouldn't I wouldn't try and bury I don't don't bury anything, frankly. Uh, you know, vulnerability is a beautiful tool in making great moving art. Um, I don't think you should bury anything. I think it's finding um creative ways of um integrating it into the space. Thank you. It's a great answer. Can I just just quickly say that it's really interesting this this because uh, I know that when we talked about um preparing, get to know the script really well, cut it up into sections or units or whatever. Um, so that's a very kind of head led and an analytical and very very good director thing to do. And I do a bit of that, and then I get into the space. I go to turn up, and I always feel and maybe this is the thing about the play again that when I get into the rehearsal room I don't know anything I kind of throw everything away I don't know anything and I I the I assume the actors are going to be the other line fed reading off the page or what their devices or whatever or memorized it they'll come in and I just I just am present with them and I start from there really and I feel my way and so I I turn up sometimes not knowing what I'm what I'm what I'm doing or anything and I just let the whatever it is present itself and work with that and that I feel really opens up crazy it's almost like you can always trust your creativity to give you the gift that you need in the space you just need to be turn up and be open to that and that is like um diving off a diving board or something you know it's really uh it's it's a really yeah it's a it's a really kind of um in the present moment thing and I mm. think it's trusting that that's that is going to deliver and just you know and that kind of in a way ameliorates anxiety mm -hmm. it yeah. always it never without fail there's always something will happen it's really brave yeah Being it's, it's yeah <laughs> Shola did you want to add anything to that um the, the question on anxiety before we move to the final question. Yeah, I think one of the things that uh, I do for actors um, is as soon as they get in, they get to lie down on the floor. 
mm -hmm. because that um, I was thinking about what Alex was saying earlier about your feet being on the floor that whole process of just we don't get to, to the chance to lie down during the day if mm. we were in, in central europe or mediterranean europe they have a siesta <laughs> we don't if you think about it we're up from the moment and, until we you know few kind of lie down and go to bed and actually lying on the floor during the day uh, after lunch before lunch when you first get in in the day and then giving yourself permission to just relax and get the journey mm. out of you is a really important thing and I and in teaching I always say to the uh, the actors the actors in training yeah just lie down and when you're ready get up and join back in the session because we do we need to just breathe most of the time our lives are generally stressful and even if they're not stressful the stress is coming from trying to survive in this kind of crazy world that we're in so um, I think all of those things you know what makes you feel relaxed. And as a director, you can create that environment in your space and just do it. There's no orthodoxy to it. There's yeah. a, sorry, there's... have I interrupted? No, you're good, you're good. There, there, there's, there's Thank that, you. No, she, she's very elderly now and uh, she was married to my supervisor at, at Bristol, uh, an actor called Pat Hayward. And she had this rule, it was brilliant. It was never stand up if you can sit down and never sit down you if you can lie, lie down. down. It work, it? <laughs> 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 and, uh, it's kind of bringing your whole self and allowing yourself to lie down and breathe yeah. and be present and to trust yourself. And saving energy, not wasting energy. Yeah, 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 yeah. it's all good. Thank you for that question, Lily. Um, so finally, we're going to go to Stephen Portlock. Yeah. Um, for your question. Thank you very much, by the way. Oh, that's great. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Oh, There's been a lot of talk about having a clear vision. Now oh. that's interesting because as writers, they can be the you can you can be. There's a, some people who are planned, there's some people who are, uh, I think it's vomitors, writing organically. So it sounds like that's quite different from the writing process. And as a director, you need to know, do you, you need to know what you're doing, the plan from the get go. Is that the case? Or if I misunderstood, or can you still create organically when, particularly when directing someone else's script? Oh, that totally. Yeah, that's what I just said about, you know, you kind of, you can have a plan. But my preference is not to come into the rehearsals and impose that, yeah. you know, that might come in a bit, but it, my preference is to actually just feel what is happening in the room. That's when you get the idea. That's when, you know, that's when it, it speaks to you or something gets created in that collaboration between the, the people, the minds, the, the other energies that are in the space. That's my, why my way. Mm -hmm. Yes, I mean, as I said, work from what the actors are doing, because they are creative artists in their own right. But I think the thing needs a focus, which is what I call the big idea. And I think whichever way you write, you need a big idea to focus whatever it is you're writing. And I think similarly with with a production, otherwise it, it tends to, to be a bit sort of all over the place. But that's not to say that the, the focus at the end, the big idea, the vision, can't actually change. It can change, but you're, you're kind of, your company needs to know where you're going. So, so it needs, needs to be shaped with someone. But I think you do certainly have to be open to their ideas because they're, they're all artists, the lighting people, the sound designers, they'll be cleverer at their jobs than you as the director are. Mm -hmm. um, Can I just add something really quickly? offer wonderful things. And it was just, yeah. just to say that one of the things that's really helped me as a blind director is to have, um, to work with an assistant director because it's really lonely at the top as well, often <laughs> in that directing role. And if you have an assistant director, somebody who's on the same wavelength as, as you, mm. you can really share that space together. Mm. Of, um, of the ideas, the bigger ideas, how things are fitting in, what direction maybe to go in at every you know stage of the you know, and I think that's something really important for mm -hmm. you know, yeah. There's yeah. one other person who can be really helpful to you, and it depends 
quite what your context is, but they'll either be the stage manager, or if you're in a in a big building based company or a big tour, it'll be a DSM. And be the, be a friend with them because they'll have their ear to the ground. One, they can be a sounding board for you. And, you, you know, as you say, it can be really lonely at the top. You know, who can I talk to? You can talk to them. They'll have their ear to the ground and can feed back things to you as well. Because mm -hmm. um, at some point the actors will get will lose confidence in you and it's really then yes. it's better they lose confidence in you rather than they lose confidence in themselves That's and it's because they're not achieving what they want to because they're trying to achieve it too fast and this you then need a pal to to crop yes. it the shoulder yes. to yes. Yeah. and your dsm yeah, your true. sm can be brilliant yeah yeah i agree yeah I, and i would sorry um i i would also just add that um I, I often enter a process with a question in my mind as opposed to an answer. So perhaps mm -hmm. um, that's another way of thinking about, you know, having something to say, having something to question, having something to ask and keep asking those questions. Mm -hmm. I, I certainly have found that working with Maria. We were, we were constantly saying, what is this about? What does this mean? Mm -hmm. And as a writer, I think I asked myself that question as well. And so that's maybe that's another way of thinking about it. Yeah. So quite quite a process. Um, I can Paula, I think you did have a final question yourself, didn't you? Yeah, it's not it's not a big question. Um, from what's been said, and from my own experiences uh, as an actor as well, um, my experience about working with actors um, who are incredibly disruptive. Um, from what you both said, why don't why is there a reluctance to sack, sack people like that? Um, well, I, I had a, I, I had an experience working with an actor, um, who, as far as I was concerned, I thought was putting everyone else at risk. Mm. Um, and, um, I, as soon as I saw him cross that line, as soon as I, I heard him cross that line where I thought, okay, now I believe that other person he is working with is at risk. Mm. I did step in and basically said, stop that's enough you've crossed a line and um i he i basically told him that if he if he crossed that line again then um we would have to discuss uh a, a change um so and what i found what i found that's happened to me actually not once but a few times where an actor has in my opinion is is no it's no longer constructive conflict yeah it's destructive conflict Every single actor that I have spoken to, once I've called them out, has shaped up. But I, I no, I, I mean, uh, but you know, there's a process. You can't, you know, it's not, it's not the easiest thing. Yeah. But, I, but I, you know, so you can't, uh, you can't just think you can tell somebody to leave. There's a process involved. But yeah. no, absolutely. I, it, I mm. you know, if somebody is actually destructively causing conflict harming mm. others in the room and it's not part of dangerous choices you know i i like to think of safe spaces dangerous mm. choices but if it's if it's actually dangerous behavior uh towards others and it's harmful then something mm. has to happen it's and i would say go i would say speak to the stage manager just like um i think <laughs> what was said in the previous comment is mm. speak to speak to somebody um and and yeah sort out what you're gonna do yeah because because i cause in the instance where i had to work with someone like that Every all the other actors, they weren't. They couldn't relax. They couldn't. Uh, they couldn't yeah. relax. They couldn't Absolutely. perform. Yeah. They couldn't do their job as well as they wanted to. And nobody yeah. was looking forward to going to rehearsals. Yeah. And they can't be creative yeah. either. No, yeah. you can't. No. So and you as a director can't. It's awful. Yeah. Yeah. And cause like, cause, yeah. Because you've all said that if anyone was rude, if any actor was rude to a member of the. But, you know, so stage, yeah, yeah. yeah. If any, that would be it. They'd, they'd be gone. The same. I think the same principle should be. I mean, it no, I didn't say they'd be gone. That's I said that's I would true, tell but... them off. I would tell them off in public. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Did it, uh, will... Maria, did you want to say something? Just, there? just quickly to to um to kind of uh, on from what Alex said is that sometimes um the situation can be complex um mm. uh, depending on who your cast are. Mm. Um, and there can be all sorts of 
barrels that you are <laughs> over in one way or another so make that decision not as simple as it would seem yeah so you when you're a director I always said you're just you're kind of cross between a social worker and sort of and those those skills really come to psychotherapist the counselor yeah, yeah. therapist mm -hmm. Yeah, I've often felt that felt that way myself about being a therapist. <laughs> and of course, everyone will be on a contract. So again, there's all the kind yeah. of legal side of yeah, things. Yeah. You yeah. know, well, everything, but everything is a process. So it's yeah, yeah. and that's yeah, but I think, yeah. So I think as a as a direct, as someone who's doing it, going to be is a new person doing it. It's always useful to know because if you get someone who's really 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 destructive as a as a new director you can just yeah. you can just be stopped in your tracks yeah yeah, yeah. you know and you, and you won't know how to move forward yeah. well, well that's when you need your networks to call on and ask whether they yeah, can yeah. you know get your yeah. advice yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah thank you very much thank you yeah. so it sounds like everyone's got some new tools for the toolbox um i'd like to sort of go around the four panelists and just hear one line or two lines just for your closing sort of little oh, mini oh statement God. for the group uh, it can just be good night if that's what you feel most comfortable with. So uh, no particular order. So we'll hear just a closing comment from uh, Dollar Maria Alex Rods when you're ready. I think I'll jump in and just say, okay. um, be ambitious. Know that you want to tell stories, whether you write, you direct, whether you dance, whether you play music, you know, whether you do all of the above and many more making films. However, have a vision about what you want to achieve. And if you really believe in what you want to achieve, you will begin to find and discover the creatives that you need to work with. And in essence, it is about believing in self and you'll stumble, you'll fall, but creatively you'll pick yourself up again. And that's what we've all done, yeah? The journey is not straightforward but it's a love of telling stories that mm -hmm. kind of, and wanting that your voice to be out there that kind of keeps you um, continuing to create. As Malcolm X said, by any means and every means necessary. Thank you, Sean. Mm. And I would say, just I would just say, be yourself, be your creative self. That is your life power that is your artistic power um use it build on it love it thank you i'm going to answer it in a slightly different way if that's okay but first of all i want to apologize to maria um i will read hound maria but i had <laughs> embarked on the hillary mantel trilogy Oh yeah, no. Do and her first. Two thirds of the way, part three, part three. So I'm going to finish. Oh, fantastic! That first. Wow. Um, <laughs> what I want to yeah, say yeah. is that I have not known Extant very long. You know, perhaps a month. But I've told you how much I love directing, and I wish you all well with it. And I want to just say I think Extant is fantastic because Extant has taught me that I don't have to be bound by what has become my disability, my vision impairment. So I think there is a hear, hear. network here. Mm -hmm. So that's thanks, Stephen's here, here, there. Thank you, Rod. Thank you for that. Um, so we've had, oh, Maria, we'll finish with you then. Oh, just very quickly to say something that was said earlier on, and that was about, um, so Alex, I think, first started to talk about the community and that, you know, things don't have to be, um, very big they can be sometimes you know the things that Shola says about um, you know uh, dreaming and exercising your skill can happen in very very small ways the community is here you know you know if you have a written it could be just you call on a couple of people to read to do a reading with you know and you just do it in a very small way and you can learn something by that and you don't know it's from like little acorns that things grow so it doesn't have to be frightening and big it could be just you know oh you know really like the sound of that person maybe they could you know it might be free on tuesday night do a zoom meet or something you know have a go yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. right so have a go um have so that's 
for us all to sleep on. And thank you for um, all the panelists. Thank you to the audience. Um, good luck with your next steps. Um, as you know, Extant are here to support. Um, so it's we haven't really had time tonight for sort of more informal networking. Um, so my challenge to you, everyone out there, just go and speak to someone new uh, from tomorrow onwards. Um, you can always ask me for your email addresses of, of someone you spotted on the call tonight or someone you heard from on the call tonight that you'd and love. And there's to always extant connect. Sorry, so there yeah. is always extant, which yeah. is once a month that Louisa runs, which is yeah. a forum for you know um, the community to come together, you know, share information. Yeah promote things, learn from each other. And it's a really great space. So yeah, yeah, because certainly tonight, it, leaning on people and us being someone to lean on is obviously super important in this world. So and in this industry. So I bid you all farewell and um, have a That's good cool. night. And thank you, everybody. Purple background, white text. Thank you to our funders, Arts Council England, Olverscroft Foundation, Leather Sellers Company, Wingate Foundation.